stepdad was the CFO for Blue. Um, oh, really? Yeah, like before they just got bought by uh, who was it? I think Sony or something. Sony. Yeah, I don't know. I've had this for a while, but yeah. they were like, I don't know, not online. The yeah. snowball. Yeah, the yeah. snowball. Well, we're already recording. Damn, yeah. you got the whole setup. That's great. I know. It's and you can see, like, how loud you're being. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully it's not overwhelmingly loud, but... Yeah. It's okay. That's why you have post-processing. Exactly. All right, let's get started. Okay, cool. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Talks with Toe. I am your host, Chris Toe. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by one broke grad student and a slightly <laughs> less broke grad student. <laughs> Why don't you decide who is who? Um, also brought to you by Science of Curiosity, of course, and last but not least, free speech. So today I'm joined by none other than Austin Lefebvre. Austin, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great so, to be here. just to start... Can you say your full name? <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Okay, Austin Epifan Yan Tongsan Lefebvre. Oh yeah, I feel like I just had to get that out of the way because <laughs> your name is pretty cool. It's yeah. unique. I got all my initials on all my publications. A U I T L. I know. Like, I feel like most of the time you see like one middle initial, mm-hmm. but yours is like three, right? <laughs> you don't have three initials. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> nice. So I guess we'll talk a little bit about like what your background is. Um, mm-hmm. Where you you know came from, what you did for school, undergrad, how you ended up in grad school, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so how did you kind of end up in grad school? Here, you your mind. Yeah, so I guess uh, you know I started off in undergrad, kind of going into bioengineering, just because um, basically my dad had cancer uh, like three times when I was growing up, so it was like a huge huge part of my life, right? Like I literally grew up with like always hearing about cancer, always seeing him like going to doctors, like getting surgeries, like, you know, literally like he went through chemotherapy and everything. So for me, it was like, um, something that was always very like prominent in my life. And so, well, first off, I knew that I wanted to do engineering, right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm coming from like a Chinese background. And, like, <laughs> so your, your mom's Chinese? Yeah, my mom's Chinese. And basically, well, what my uncle always used to say on my Chinese side, he's like, you have to do something that ends in earring. Like anything that ends in earring is cool. So basically it's some kind of engineering. Yeah, right? I, I understand um, that. And so uh, I was thinking about mechanical for a while, but since I was like so kind of involved in the field or like, you know, involved with like cancer in my life. Um, and also because like actually my grandpa was a doctor as well. Uh, I wanted to do something kind of body related, like human body related. So I went to bioengineering. Um, And then, yeah, so from there, uh, I knew that I wanted to study cancer in some way. So I joined a lab um, that was focusing on basically looking at um, mutations in like the metabolic pathways of cancer. Okay. And how... So for people who are listening who may not be super science savvy, um, what is like a metabolic pathway? Yeah. So basically, so think about like when you eat an apple, right? Like those apples get converted to essentially energy in your body, right? So something goes goes on in your body where that apple um, is basically just a source of energy, right? It's like calories and calories are energy. And so what the cell does, is something similar, but they take those components and they break it down to like the molecular form of energy, right? So ATP, and that's essentially metabolism. Um, and so basically cancer uses, it, it can have essentially mutations in those pathways that um essentially allow it to either overproduce or like you know basically it's dysregulated in some way which can lead to excessive growth or even like uh the spread of cancer metastasis metastasis yeah um so basically we're looking at those pathways and looking at how they use it differently and how we can essentially target those mutations so we can only kill off the cancer cells rather than like normal healthy cells okay interesting so yeah I guess before we get a little bit too far down yeah, that yeah. rabbit hole, um, when let's talk about how you got to grad school, like what that process was like. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, it kind of goes from. off of that. Like, yeah. I'll keep it basic though. Yeah, but yeah. Like, um, basically, from there, I kind of realized like how how little there was in the realm of like cancer spreading, like research in the spread of cancer. Mm. 
Um, and that was mostly due to a lack of essentially engineering method, like, you know, basically a lack of methods to look at that. Um, and so like C and, you know, like 90% of cancer related deaths actually occur because of this metastasis because of the spread, right? It's, it's super hard to essentially cure once it's starting to spread to other distant sites. Um, so I wanted to kind of look at that specifically and figure out how we could study that a little more in depth. So I found a lab, um, essentially this imaging lab uh, here at UC Irvine, um, Michelle Digman's and Enrico Gritton's lab, the LFD. Mm -hmm. um, and they have, you know, amazing imaging techniques where we can essentially look at this process that normally, um, you know, it's, it's really hard to study this process just because it's so, first off, like fleeting, right? It's so rare. Uh, only a few of these cells really have this phenotype that eventually leads to metastasis. Um, and, and because the phenotype is like mm -hmm. basically, I guess, I don't yeah, know like saying. yeah, basically, it's it's uh, a characteristic of a cell, right? Like so few of these cells have this characteristic um, that eventually leads it to become a tumor in like a different place. Um, so uh, not only that, it's also you know it's hard to look at cells on a single cell level. Um, so like an individual cell, it's very hard to kind of analyze and look at its characteristics. So typically that's why it's so hard to look at these other sites because there are so few of them and it's just, it's pretty rare. So, you know, there are a lot of techniques in this lab, which, um, essentially allow you to do single cell analysis. Um, and also, you know, basically just analyze them on like a molecular level, which is, would be essentially super useful for looking mm -hmm. at metastasis. So I kind of basically it was because of that you know lack of those lack of methods that i wanted to get into engineering specifically and specifically this lab because i thought there was a good opportunity there nice yeah that's super cool um i guess like since you guys are primarily looking at cell dynamics and like how these uh tumor cells are like i guess moving and growing mm -hmm. um like what are some of those techniques that you guys use um and specifically like i guess what is your your project right now yeah, so my pro project basically revolves around the mitochondria, which are basically, well, the powerhouse of the cell, right, <laughs> as everyone learns about. Um, but essentially, they're the source of this generation of energy, right? Like, they're the, they're, that's why they're called the powerhouse, right? Like, they generate this energy for the cell. Um, and so basically, there are two main mechanisms that generate energy. It's through either the mitochondria, which is, you know, basically you use oxygen to eventually create ATP down the line. Um, and so that happens in the mitochondria. But then if you don't have oxygen, typically you resort to glycolysis, which is essentially, um, you know, it's a, it's a much less efficient way of creating energy, but it can also output a bunch of different molecules that help the cell um, do other functions. Um, and so essentially uh, cancer has a very dysregulated metabolism, as I was saying. And so what we wanted to look at was essentially this balance between this oxidative phosphorylation, so this mitochondrial uh, energy pathway and this gly glycolysis pathway. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can do that just like non-invasively um, because the cells essentially, they have uh, this molecule that emits a light when you shine it at a certain wavelength, it's just naturally. Like you don't have to probe it with anything. Um, if you just shine it, shine a light at a certain wavelength, it emits another light at a certain wavelength. And just from that, you can't tell much, but if you look at how long that um, fluorescence lasts, uh, that'll tell you essentially the relative amount of oxphos versus glycolysis. So that kind of helps us gauge um, in different conditions how cells, how these cancer cells are generating energy. Um, so I'm looking at that specifically in the mitochondria, mm -hmm. as well as like how the cells use oxygen. Um, so I'm, I'm basically using these probes that can sense oxygen in their environment and they change again, like how long this fluorescence lasts based off of like how much oxygen there is. Um, and so basically I'm just trying to essentially characterize the mitochondria and how they're making energy, how they're behaving um, in different steps of metastasis. And so uh, I'm working with some collaborators right now that are essentially they're injecting um, cancer cells into mice and if the mice essentially have a deficient immune system they'll actually start growing tumors because of this injection um, and so we can essentially 
inject these cells, it'll create some kind of primary tumor and it also essentially start spreading to different parts of the body. Um, so it's called essentially micrometastases, right? So there'll be little micrometastases, mi micro yeah. like in the lung, for example. Like small small tumors that appear from the, away mm -hmm. from the original site. Yeah, exactly. And so we can take these cells and we can start um, essentially analyzing them or we can look at um, in different conditions, do are there more metastases that show up or less metastases? Um, and so we can analyze this using all those techniques that I was just talking about, like looking at the mitochondria, mm -hmm. as well as uh, if we have patient cells, we can actually um, grab like like human patients, right? If mm -hmm. they have breast cancer, I'm looking at mostly breast cancer. Okay. And so if, if we take some of those cells from those breast cancer patients, we can start growing them into essentially these spheres. So these like little spheroids um, and it, it's supposed to essentially represent a more natural environment for the tumors, right? And so depending on how invasive it is, I'm kind of trying to look at, you know, um, if these are super invasive cells, do they have different characteristics than like a less invasive cell or just like a normal breast epithelial cell that's not cancerous? Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully, you know, figuring out those different uh, functions of the mitochondria within these different, you know, types of or like aggressive cancer cells, uh, we can hopefully kind of find targets that we could, you know, specifically drug or inhibit you know like specific target essentially um to kill off these uh, cells that are invasive and mm -hmm. that will lead to this cancer spreading yeah so there is like a distinction between like benign and malignant tumors mm -hmm. right so like yeah obviously we want to solve the malignant tumors because yeah. they're the ones that metastasize the mm -hmm. most and end up traveling to places you don't want them to travel mm -hmm. um so like when you guys are using uh, these, I guess, fluorescence techniques. Mm -hmm. um, like, what kind of equipment do you use? You just, yeah, have, you just probably have something specialized for that, right? Yeah, it's like it's it's pretty high tech and it's kind of terrifying to use because <laughs> it's literally like these. Like the one that I mo may s mainly use is uh, essentially this like laser scanning microscope with like a bunch of different like lasers attached to it, like um, and essentially like ways to like look at all this. Um, you know the emitted light and you know characterize it whatever mm -hmm. but i mean it's like a million dollar piece of equipment and yeah which is crazy <laughs> yeah and like the first couple times i was using it i was like i had no idea what i was doing and i was kind of just flipping switches because there was like a paper that kind of listed like what i was supposed to do to turn it on it was terrifying like i was like nervous i was like sweating it's like if i mess this up like is this on me and i don't know it was just it was kind of scary but yeah. um you know eventually it's 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 just like anything else like you get used to it and and you know you use it like normal mm -hmm. um but yeah so essentially they're they're pretty intense pieces of equipment these optics that are essentially you know many of these techniques are derived from like astrophysics where you know they're right. they're yeah. looking at different emissions or they, they're looking at different like um essentially like super high resolution stuff uh, mm -hmm. and yeah i mean i think lasers were actually originally mm -hmm. a dod funded yeah research experiment sure. and now nowadays we have lasers in like literally everything yeah you know like you have lasers in like dvd players you have oh, lasers yeah. in like all crazy like there's mm -hmm. also lasers that are actually like used. little pointing lasers yeah, too, like, like super easy but i think there was there's some story about how the the first laser that was like turned on mm -hmm. like back in the day like back in the 1900s or whatever yeah. was in like la and they actually like blacked out half of LA because oh, it drew so much energy. <laughs> like, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Those things are insane. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like, I mean, in our lab, when we're setting up lasers, you like have to put so many protective layers in front of that laser if you don't know like mm. what it's emitting at. Because I mean, like literally some of my lab mates were just setting one up the other day and it like, you shine the laser and there's this, you know, you put basically protectors, right? Mm -hmm. In front of it that are like super thick pieces of, I think it's, maybe glass or something but essentially it's supposed to like dim the laser as it goes through it so mm -hmm. you don't burn anything after it and so as soon as this laser was just blasting through it and like immediately as they turn it on it just shatters and like everything after it shatters too and that's like hundreds of dollars worth of stuff just because <laughs> they turn on the laser and it was like way too powerful and like basically if those weren't there like the whole there would have been like a hole in the wall yeah so it's, it's insane <laughs> like um yeah there's a lot of it's also kind of insane how easy it is to get a hold of class four lasers. 
Mm-hmm. So for those of you guys who don't know, I guess, um, lasers are classified, what, one? Well, it depends on who you're at. It depends on yeah. which system you're using, but typically one, two, th- and like three. Mm-hmm. And there's like a classification of four of like everything else. Yeah. But class four and up is like the laser that like just legit burn through things. Yeah. Right? So it's like, sure. yeah, those are crazy. But it's like really easy to get them. Yeah, yeah. Like if I wanted to, I could just go buy one online. Right. right now. Yeah. Easy. It's like weird. I know. <laughs> I don't know. It's not very well controlled. Maybe... <laughs> They just think that who would want to buy, like, a laser anyway, but... I yeah, know. I mean, obviously a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. There's also that video from, like, the Navy where they were shooting down a drone with a laser. I can not see that. Yeah, you should look it up. That's cool. Yeah, I think the Navy has, like, actually, like, laser-mounted... That's Like, crazy, anti-aircraft yeah. weapons. That's where everything is, like... <laughs> do you, like, everything comes from the DoD. All this research, so... Yeah, that's the thing that's, like, interesting. I feel like... A lot of the, because we use a lot of physics research yeah. to help us in biology. Yeah. But even things like, you know, like MRIs, those mm-hmm. were all like originally physics projects. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like that's like a super magnet. Yeah. Like, I mean, people use them basically in MRIs, like the same thing as like looking at, um, what's it called? That technique uh, to look at hydrogen bond. Uh, oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's um, quantum flipping basically yeah it was crazy yeah like i took a class on it once yeah, yeah. if people are interested they should definitely look at how mm-hmm. mris work because yeah. i don't know how the heck anyone figured out how to make it work honestly like, it's a lot of quantum physics actually i don't know if you ever got an mri but that thing is terrifying it's so loud yeah and you're literally sitting there and you can't move right like, yeah you're just like i mean essentially you're just like you feel like you're in a coffin and then you just have this like ton piece of metal yeah. spinning around you like super fast and yeah. like I don't know it's crazy it's also super cool because yeah. they have to super cool the magnets so I think they use like liquid like helium or something or nitrogen no, yeah. I don't know that's crazy but, I wouldn't doubt it though yeah it's like like they can't turn it off mm. so like any hospital that has a because it when they turn it off it takes so much energy to turn it back on and that and it's like, like cool it back in yeah it, that it just like is more cost effective to just always leave it on that's crazy <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty funny. But that's crazy, too, because, like, before MRIs, like, if, pe- if doctors wanted to know what was happening mm-hmm. inside people's bodies, they had to, like... Like, open them up. Cut them open. Yeah. And go into <laughs> surgery. So it's like, look, we don't have to do surgery now. We can yeah. use MRIs. And it's, it's like, nuts. Yeah. All these imaging techniques that are popping up is crazy. And, like, that's one thing that I love about UCI is, like, it's, it's home to the Beckman Laser Institute, right? And it's... Which is, like, one of the most renowned laser institutes in the nation and i mean they're coming up with these crazy multimodal ways to like look at the human body like using all these different like even like the stuff that i'm using like this fluorescence lifetime stuff mixed with like ct mixed with like you know all this different stuff to like look at the body without harming them yeah. essentially without cutting them open yeah and ct uh ct are x-ray scans right? yeah yeah definitely. it's just a bunch of yeah. x-rays basically to yeah. take it's like a 3d x-ray of your body 3d x-ray yeah 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 that's pretty crazy so yeah. you, you guys work a lot with Dr. Patan, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what's that collaboration like? I mean, I wouldn't even call it a collaboration. It's like <laughs> the LFD is basically Michelle, so Digman's lab and Raton's lab uh, in one, right? Mm. And so essentially Enrico's lab is supposed to be kind of the side that develops these new microscopes, these new imaging techniques, these new ways to analyze those images and essentially... Um, and essentially Michelle's lab, uh, so D- the Digman lab is essentially responsible for um, finding applications for that in the biological field. Mm. So, you know, we're mostly the ones that are collaborating with other labs to figure out um, how to apply these techniques, like how to, so for example, like fluctuation correlation spectroscopy is okay, basically, is <laughs> yeah, so I'm already done. So basically it's looking at how, so fluorescence, right, is basically cell, or the emission of light, essentially the emission of light, right? Yeah. And so we're looking at how this light is being emitted as we're like capturing an image uh, at a certain frame rate, like a a certain whatever, like um, frame length, things like Mm -hmm. that. And so we can use that information and the speed of like how we're capturing it to essentially figure out how fast um, whatever is fluorescing is moving. Oh, dang. Yeah, so I mean, it's super cool. So we can look at like the speed of uh, diffusing protein or like the, the diffusion coefficient of a protein. We can figure out if that protein is, you know, or that molecule is like 
within a confined environment or if it's like being blocked as it passes something or if it's um you know if it's if it's binding to something like things like that um mm -hmm. just by looking just by like basically capturing it super fast and like, so looking like at how it moves. what is like the <clears throat> i guess the frame rate that you guys are capturing at usually um it depends so you want to tailor it to essentially the protein because if you mm -hmm. capture too fast uh, essentially you're gonna pass over the molecule, right? So like, let's say your molecule is moving like this slow and you're like capturing this fast, you're only gonna have a couple frames to work with. But if you're capturing too slow, then obviously the molecule is gonna get out of the frame and it's you're, you're gonna miss it essentially. So you essentially wanna tailor your frame rate based off of um, what, what, you the, the, yeah, what you think the, yeah, what you think, how fast it moves. Okay, and that that's probably from like literature from other papers. Yeah, like either that, make. but you can also do what's called like single point fluctuation correlation spectroscopy, which is essentially just looking at a single point and looking at the molecules that pass in and out of it, and that'll give you a general sense of the average diffusion coefficient. Got it. So you have, so, you have multiple data points to work with. Yeah, and basically you you work off of that data to tailor your like image wide scanning ah, okay. yeah nice so yeah they're kind of different ways to figure out how to yeah do. hopefully everyone followed that <laughs> yeah a little, a little that uh, was very like but... in the weeds but yeah um yeah so like i guess you you interact with dr patan a lot then right actually i don't talk to him that much oh you don't he's okay. super busy um that's true he's like famous though so. yeah and also very intimidating so <laughs> um i guess for context for people who are listening dr patan is like this like your typical academic mm -hmm. but Italian. Yeah, I don't know if you know who Enrico Fermi is. Um, yeah, Enrico Fermi. Yeah, so yeah. Enrico Gratton's dad worked under Enrico Fermi, so I've heard. Okay. Um, so I mean that's huge, and yeah. then like obviously he his dad got him into science and okay. all this, but yeah. But yeah, for people I mean, who don't know, Enrico Fermi was one of the people who was responsible for the atomic bomb, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he was also some crazy... He's a huge thing. There's like, so. the, like the Fermi constant is named after him. Yeah, the Fermi paradox. Okay, Fermi paradox, that's what it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah, so basically, I mean, Enrico is like the pioneer in the field, like one of the, the biggest pioneers in the field of fluctuation correlation spectroscopy of uh, these different techniques to analyze this fluorescent data. Um, and I mean, like all of his postdocs are incredibly smart and I'm like blessed to work with them every day because I mean, they're, they're it's like insane. Like I feel so humbled by everything they say. Um, that's, but, kind of, that's kind of the fun part about grad school though. Like yeah. you do meet these like really amazing people who yeah. are just like, I don't know, that just opens your perspective on like what is possible. Yeah. But also like how much we don't really know. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Because, I mean, like, it's literally, like, the cutting edge, and these people are trying to develop, you know, these techniques that no one's thought of, which is crazy, right? Like, yeah. it's it's literally new techniques with age-old, you know, imaging, right? you know, technology, essentially. But I guess, like, in the grand scheme of things, it's, like, not really that age-old, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. I mean, I, I guess... mean, age-old for, like, definitely, like, you know, a couple hundred years or whatever, but... yeah. But like, I mean, even lasers weren't invented until like what the seventies. Yeah, say? something like that. Sixties or seventies. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, people were using a bunch of weird stuff to like look at fluorescence before that, right? Yeah. How did people so. do fluorescence before lasers? Because like now it's kind of like you say the word fluorescence and everyone just like assumes laser. Yeah. I mean, you can use like UV, right? Because most things will right. get, we'll get excited by like UV. Um, but then you end up like destroying a lot of things with UV yeah, too. Yeah, it's right? super hard to look at live cells if you're not using um, invisible light yeah. or higher. Yeah, because ultraviolet lights are like, basically like almost like sun rays. Yeah, but exactly. Like the radiation almost, mm -hmm. almost, not quite, but. It's just, it's, it's just powerful. There's a lot of energy, yeah. so it's just gonna fry things, essentially. Yeah, you yeah. gotta be really careful with the UV, because. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, going back to Enrico, um, yeah, I mean, he's, you know, I get to see him all the time and, like, see him talk and see him, like, you know, interact with his collaborators, interact with, like, the postdocs and things like that. And he's, like, you can tell, like, he's so patient with people. He's so, like, he he really, he knows so much. Like, anything you talk to him about, it's, like, somehow he knows the background of it. 
even if it's like not completely in his field mm-hmm. you know like all the biology stuff that i've talked to him about like it's like he already knew what i was talking about. even though i felt like i was looking at this like super recent literature that like had just been found out um but yeah i mean it's just it's it's great to see that and kind of experience that and like it makes me want to kind of be that person to like you know my students and to my um, undergrads and like whatever visiting people mm-hmm. to come in so um, do you know if you want to like go more academic route or like more <laughs> i'm like <laughs> we were just talking about this today right and yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, today I said, like, you know, I have, I have no idea. But, and it's, like, half true. Like, I feel like part of me really likes academia because there's so much freedom, right? Like, well, to an extent, right? I mm-hmm. mean, obviously, you have to get funding to be able to do projects. But right. yeah. typically, like, it's way more free than going into industry. Like, you can kind of, you you know what topic you want to look at. Um, you, you, like you know you, you you essentially from step zero to the end you can tailor the entire project to exactly like what you want to do um whereas you know industry it's very limited based off of like you know sometimes you, you just kind of end up being like a cog in like yeah the factory or whatever the saying is right um, there's other competing factors i guess yeah. and also not not only with projects but also with time right it seems like in academia you can kind of decide your own schedule like if you want to work into the night go for it and if you want to like take two weeks off like in the middle of the quarter and like you know or like a month off or whatever or like go and like spend a couple weeks writing then that's like totally fine and no one's going to say anything about that um as long as you like end up producing results for your funding sources and things Mm -hmm. like that uh, but industry is just not like that, right? Like you have to be around for certain things, and you can't. Sometimes you can't just Skype in, and you can't. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah, so I definitely like that aspect, and even being a grad student, like I just took essentially two weeks off. I went to France, All right? And because your dad's side's from France, right? yeah, my dad's side's from France, so I went to go visit some family over there, and essentially, I was like super jet lagged for like <laughs> you know the first few days, and. Since I'm preparing for essentially my advancement, which is, you know, like uh, essentially the next step in my PhD, I have to present and write a paper and things like that. Um, I, I, w- I would wake up at like three in the morning and just write for like five hours with a huge pot of coffee until everyone woke up. And then I would just kind of hang out with them all day and then repeat. So it was like, I mean, it's like a super, like you don't have to be, mm-hmm. you can kind of like tailor your own schedule around yourself. Yeah. I definitely appreciate that too. Yeah. I think you have the ability to explore also and just like mm. people don't shoot down your ideas <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it's like you just like i literally today i was talking to brody i was like mm-hmm. my advisor he because we've been doing cancer stuff too so like, yeah. we've been looking more at the genetic aspect of it so more the the microbio stuff um but yeah i was like hey like maybe we could start looking at things like alzheimer's because it's mm-hmm. like maybe also there might be a genetic component to alzheimer's and he was like super open and down for that so yeah. that that's pretty cool might be doing that soon we'll yeah. see yeah, yeah right. it's so easy to bring these things up to them yeah it's like as long as you have some kind of like reason that you're bringing it up yeah. it's like they're probably not going to shoot it down i mean there are definitely some advisors that are like <laughs> no don't do anything except what i tell you yeah i don't i feel like there's not really anyone like that in our department though yeah not that i know I'm definitely not going to name the names, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I know, like, my advisor, I mean, she is the most open person to, like, anything I suggest, right? Yeah, like, I've never had a negative interaction yeah. with Dr. Digman. She's... Yeah. She's yeah. so nice, too. I mean, yeah. Um, so it's great. It's great to have an advisor like that. Yeah, so I guess, what's the next step for you after... <laughs> after advancement? After or? advancement, yeah. <laughs> uh, just get those experiments done, I guess. Yeah, how many experiments are you running right now? I'm like, I mean, I'm trying to put them all together right now. So it's there's the couple experiments that I'm doing with that collaborator that I was talking about, like mm-hmm. the mouse stuff. Um, and so that's been going on for like a couple months now. We've got like a, a paper that we just submitted. So it's in review right now. And then we want to get another one out by like November. And I'm like, I'm not like a first or second author or anything. I'm like somewhere down there, right? <laughs> but You're on the paper. So. Yeah, I'm on the paper. Right. And like, and, and plus like, um using these techniques i mean these techniques aren't like the most well-known or well-trusted techniques just because there isn't that much literature on it like this stuff is like new since probably 2008 which is really young in the field of science right um and so 
you know, even just getting papers out there in like high impact journals where you're doing, you're using these techniques, it definitely gives more credibility to these techniques. So later on, it'll make publishing other papers a lot easier. Have you guys been able to do that so far? Do what? Like high impact journals. With oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've got like, we just published basically our nature methods paper on like how to do this phlegm stuff um, in cells and how to essentially analyze all of your phlegm data, the fluorescence lifetime data um, using the software that Enrico built, um, SimFCS. Mm -hmm. um, so already, I mean, that was published, I think a couple months ago and already it's getting a bunch of citations and it's going to, I mean, hopefully just having that in nature methods is right. It's either nature methods or protocol. I can't remember, but either way it's having it in such a renowned journal is yeah. definitely going to help push that technique out there. If you didn't know, you can find Talks with Toe on Spotify and Google Play and coming soon to Apple Podcasts. Also, if you're more of a visual learner, we'll soon have video content on YouTube. Head over there and subscribe to Talks with Toe. And now, back to the show. What would you say, at least in our field, are like kind of the, the gold standard journals? Because I think most people don't realize that there's a lot of scientific journals, mm -hmm. but they're kind of specific based on the field you're in. Yeah. And like, there's some journals where like, if this, you're in this journal and you're published in this journal, then like you're legit. Yeah, and so. you're gonna get like a faculty position at yeah. like a school. Yeah. Yeah. Um, top one is probably gonna be at least for our stuff. It's probably gonna be like nature, right? Yeah, like nature. straight up yeah. nature, um, cell. Yeah, cell's science, pretty big up there. Yeah, science. Um, and then there are things like uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, which is probably the I think it's the the highest impact journal. It's got like something like a fifty or sixty impact. I think okay. it's like sixty impact. I, I want to yeah, say it's like sixty, yeah. which is basically on average how many times a paper gets cited, uh, which is super high. I mean, I think ninety five percent of publications get like zero citations or yeah. something like that. So when you have one where on average papers get cited like sixty plus times, that's like insane. Mm -hmm. Um. And, but in my field specifically, I mean, we publish a lot to um, biophysical journal, which is okay, essentially, yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's essentially um, a lot of new technology or uh, methods to kind of use physics type things to look at biological things. You guys ever published uh, proceedings of National Academy of Sciences? Yeah, we have, a couple, yeah. we have a couple of PNAS papers um, using our techniques like phlegm and fluctuation correlation to look at like yeah because that journal is a little bit more physics oriented also right? yeah yeah it's definitely higher impact so it's harder to get your paper in there yeah so if we're just trying to publish we'll usually go to like you know bps biophysical sciences and plus like um you know michelle and enrico are super well known in essentially that field of biophysics um so every time they go to a conference i mean they they're either like hosting it or they're hosting specific like sections or they're getting awards there so it's like it's nice to be able to publish in that journal and have everyone kind of like know who you are and, and trust like what you're publishing. Yeah. Which is huge. I mean, yeah. yeah. Do you guys do any, uh, like when you're doing stuff, like do you do any like genetic stuff for your cells or anything? Uh, I mean, the most genetic will go is like basically transfections. Okay. Right. So essentially we're taking a piece of DNA that maybe is, um, has another part of it that codes for like a fluorescent marker, right? Mm -hmm. And then when we transfect these cells, so when we put this piece of DNA into the cells, they'll express uh, the protein that we want to look at uh, attached to like a fluorescent protein, so we can okay. visualize it. But you guys use CRISPR for that, or you guys use no? Something? I haven't used CRISPR. I just okay. use like lipofectamine, okay, right? like lipofection, the OG stuff, <laughs> yeah, or like um, nucleofection, just because I mean. It, I'm pretty sure it's cheaper than CRISPR, and it's also, uh, I mean, we just have the reagents for it, so. <laughs> That's, I mean, it, it's good enough. That's what it comes down to yeah. a lot of times. Like, what do you got in the lab? All right, we're going to use that until yeah. we don't have any more of it. And especially because, like, most of the knowledge gets passed down from older people, and, like, if they don't know how to do something, you have to, like, figure it out on your own, and if it's easy enough to just do based off, like, how they did it, then and if it's trusted, then it's, mm -hmm. like, it's fine. Yeah. You know? Have you heard about the whole like gene edited babies in China? <laughs> yeah, didn't uh, yeah, didn't the guy like go to jail or something for it? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's almost been a year. Dang. But since that happened, but that was yeah. like 
he kind of disappeared for a while, <laughs> yeah. and then like some journalists found him in a hotel in China, like like under guard. But super weird. Yeah, dude, weird things happen in China. Yeah. But, what do you What do you think about that? Like, you think you want? Do you agree with editing? I don't know, dude. That's like I I don't really agree with that because it's like yeah. I think I think it's very dangerous mm. because. There's just so much about the human genome that we don't know, yeah. you know, and like, just like ethically, ethically speaking, like, if you don't know what you're doing to someone, mm -hmm. like, and especially since these babies were carried to term, like, they're, yeah. they're alive now, right? Like, they're twins, right? I think so, yeah, but they're like in vitro twins, mm -hmm. so they're right. like, so I, I, I was reading up something like they basically like immediately after in vitro fertilization. Which is where, like, for those who are listening, like, sperm and the egg are joined in, like, a dish outside mm. of the mother. Then they did the, the, the gene editing outside mm. and then implanted into the mother. Oh, wow. So, like, legit, like, I don't know. But I don't know. It's, like, difficult because it's, like, they're, you don't know what you're doing to these people. Yeah. I mean, you think you know what you're doing. But I who mean, knows? He that? says he knows what he's right. doing. But, but how <laughs> do you test it, right? Because he edited... Um, Basically, he wanted to prevent them from ever being able to get HIV, right? Right, yeah. But if you don't expose them to HIV, like, how would you know if it actually worked or not? And I don't think ethically you can just expose them to HIV. Yeah, and the other thing is also, like, we have methods to, like, handle HIV now, mm -hmm. also. So it's like, it wasn't a necessary thing, too. Right. I think that's the other ethical issue with that. It's like, also, there's a lot of studies coming out now that are like, well, like, this this gene that they removed, like... Typically, people who don't have this gene, mm -hmm. like, are also more prone to getting a flu. Because mm -hmm. it's like... Or even if, if they did, like, um, you know, like, what are those, like, uh, super rare genetic um, defects that some people have just because, you know, they're carrying two of the... Oh, yeah, carrier mutations. Yeah, like, yeah. carrier mutations. I mean, if they, if they removed that carrier mutation, or maybe if they, like... Or if that baby was going to get that disease mm -hmm. and they removed, like, those mutations. I mean, that probably would have been better, right? Because then you can actually see, like, oh, that kid, like, didn't end up with that disease. Yeah, or... maybe, but... Yeah, that's, like... And they could have done it in patients, like, where both of the parents were carriers. Yeah, that's that's difficult to, like, tell also, because it's, like... Since we always get two copies, mm -hmm. it's, like... You, do you know when someone's going to be a carrier until, like, those copies are actually joined? Yeah, because like, how do I mean, you how do yeah. you check how do you check whether or not someone has the carrier stuff right. like prior to fertilization? Yeah, or if both parents are like, how both of them have that disease right. right that are recessive, so they would have to pass it on to their kid essentially. Yeah, so then That's you could true. say, yeah. okay, if we edit those mutations out, let's see if this kid ends up without that disease and if yeah. it does then you know that it worked right yeah i don't know it still sketches me out dude yeah i mean yeah it's still a little <laughs> sketchy especially at this early of a stage yeah there's just i mean crispr was introduced like what like 10 years ago yeah i mean it's been around long enough and people mm -hmm. have known that we could do this but yeah there's like it'll be interesting to see like how the scientific community like continues to react to it yeah because now there's like some scientists in Russia is like oh I want to duplicate the experiment I was like dude like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> like no <laughs> yeah yeah well okay let's say like this thing worked perfectly yeah right? yeah and like let's say you knew exactly what you were modifying you knew exactly what it was gonna like mm -hmm. produce in the kid then would you trust this like would you think it's like okay to do um I would have to say that it would really depend on like what the disease is mm -hmm. and whether or not it's only used for the cases of diseases mm -hmm. okay and so if it was used so, just for like let's say physical appearance characteristics well yeah because then you're getting into eugenics at that right. point which is like like nazi stuff yeah. you know so like that's that's kind of where the ethical dilemma mm -hmm. is like how do you how do you draw that line of mm -hmm. how much gene editing in a person is like required mm -hmm. and like how much of it is like okay yeah you know and i think that's a conversation that's gonna have to keep happening but like mm -hmm. 
that's that's what, that's what kind of concerns me because it's like mm. if you can gene edit one thing mm. you can basically gene edit anything yeah so like once you open that floodgate like even if you had governmental regulations i mean everyone's just the rich yeah they'll be able to there's produce. gonna be there's gonna always be people who are able to do it outside of yeah. government regulations regardless so it's like mm. yeah, yeah i guess i've had like super conflicting like over the years conflicting like yeah. opinions about it because actually thinking about it now um back when i was like in middle school high school i was like super interested in like all this like android stuff right mm -hmm. like being able to like let's say reconfigure your eyes to like have some kind of heads-up display in them and like being able to like you know jump higher like run faster if you had like a bionic legs and mm -hmm. things like that and like you know theoretically you would be able to do that like maybe not the heads up display stuff but yeah. like theoretically you'd be able to although there's some research that's trying to do it really genetically or not genetically but okay. like but if you had like implanted yeah, eyeballs or something, something yeah. Like that, yeah um and so i don't know i always thought that was super cool and that was one of the reasons why i got into engineering also mm -hmm. um because like i want to do cool cyborg shit right? <laughs> and i think a lot of people like go into engineering like think about that yeah but i mean it's very true like, i don't know if you played like deus ex machina i've seen it i've never actually played that game but like... yeah so i mean it kind of it kind of goes into like that whole dilemma of like you know all the rich people can get these upgrades and be able yeah. to like you know they're like the supreme beings right the supreme humans whereas all the poor people like they're just stuck on the streets they're like yeah i mean that's a real danger also. yeah and it's sure. like i mean there's that other game that's coming out with it cyberpunk mm. 2077 like mm -hmm. that's also kind of like along the same vein where it's like yeah. it's envisioning this future where um these like mechanical enhancements that are like attached to people mm -hmm. is actually a reality and like it's basically like a dystopian future type yeah. of thing it's like people are instead of like the organ black market it's mm -hmm. like the cybernetic parts black market yeah. so it's like yeah, so I don't know. It's a very interesting question because, mm -hmm. like, it's weird because now we're kind of approaching that mm -hmm. phase in science like, and yeah, It's not technology. that much of science fiction anymore. Yeah, it's not super science fiction anymore. Mm -hmm. It's possible to edit someone's genome. Mm -hmm. It's possible to... Have an implanted eyeball that gives yeah. those heads up displays. It's Yeah, and then, like, you know, what Dr. Nanoditch is doing, he's doing a lot of EEG stuff where mm -hmm. it's possible to get someone's brain signals and like send those signals into their mm. legs so that they can walk again and it's not even that hard i mean i'm not like putting down yeah. like the research or anything it is hard to like perfect it but like even for my senior design project it was me and like four other undergrad seniors right and we literally put together a bionic arm made out of like coat hangers uh duct tape and like an iron man like overlay just so it looked cool um <laughs> and we literally like had it connected to an eeg using machine learning um machine you know machine learning uh algorithms to essentially decode it and like be able to close and like rotate your hand yeah. and like we did that in like the span of like you know a year which is nuts yeah it's it's pretty crazy like technology is definitely advanced and i don't think I don't know. I feel like we should be having that conversation more often because it's like, yeah. dude, you can't just keep putting this conversation off. Because mm -hmm. I think that's Elon Musk's big thing too with his like whole uh, the Neuralink. Neuralink, yeah. yeah. Yeah, where he's like basically trying to advance the human mind to the point where we can outcompete AI, right? Yeah, I, I don't know about that one. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like I don't know, AI is definitely powerful, mm -hmm. but. The state that it's in right now is still very much like you need human input yeah. to create these AI forms and stuff like that. So, yeah. But how fast it's evolving, though, is kind of the scary part, right? Yeah, because, that's true. I mean, it's just going to get faster and better. <laughs> um, yeah, as we get more computing power. Yeah. I mean, they're trying to do quantum computing now, too. Mm -hmm. like, I think, like... People like kind of vaguely hear what quantum computing is, but like basically right now, all our computers are uh, like physical like transistors, mm -hmm. like they're electrical components. And the only reason they get faster every year, and the only reason we get new iPhones and that type of stuff, is because we're getting better at making them smaller, mm -hmm. so we can fit more of them on a smaller area. Yeah. But we're getting to the point where they're so small that we have to go atomic. Yeah, it's nuts. So then, like once you go atomic, then you have the problem of like quantum physics mm -hmm. 
so like there's a bunch of smart people trying to do quantum computing which is like like insane (laughs) because like it's not just like ones and zeros it opens up like basically like quantum spins so like instead of just having a one and a zero for binary you have like up down you have an up down and like a maybe yeah (laughs) maybe (laughs) that's the best way i can explain it because i'm not a quantum Uh. physicist but like and then like there's like four different states so then you have Mm. like literally quadrupled the computing power potentially wow that's nuts yeah that's crazy yeah i haven't read too much about it but (laughs) it seems nuts yeah nice well i don't know i guess what else do you like to do during your off time as a grad student (laughs) what i like to do um we were talking about this today right in the panel that we were speaking on to the new students but um yeah i mean i really like to stay active um because i i honestly like i know myself when i don't exercise during the day and when i do and like i just know i'm way happier way more like awake and alert the next day when i'm like when I've done some kind of activity. Yeah. So like, whether it be weightlifting or like playing volleyball or like going surfing or rock climbing or whatever. Yeah, we rock climb sometimes. I haven't gone rock climbing so long, but yes, I'm down. <laughs> we should definitely do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. And it just makes me happier and, and work better basically. And it doesn't feel like I'm just only lab all the time, <laughs> which is like. Yeah, that's definitely true. I think like, yeah, there's definitely a weird thing where nowadays we definitely don't do as much physical activity mm-hmm. as we used to. Because um, mm-hmm. even like when you walk around campus now, but like the new incoming like freshmen on mm-hmm. college campuses, they're just always on their phones. Yeah, it's like, crazy. Like always. Have you seen like videos of like you know New York or whatever in like the 1990s or like early 2000s even, where like literally just people walking, no one's looking down, and it's so weird to see. Yeah, like it's just. Because, it, I mean, nowadays, like, you look around and everyone's, like, looking down. Yeah, I was, like, even, like, when you hop into a car, right? Like, you're in a car mm-hmm. with someone and, like, you can't go anywhere. Yeah. And, like, the natural thing would actually be to talk to each other. Right. But most people, like, once they get in the car, they just immediately pull out their phone. Yeah. It's an easy, easy way out, right? Yeah. You don't have to put in the effort. It's, like, I don't know. I feel like that's kind of, like, messing with our society or something. Oh, for sure. <laughs> for sure. But, and I think people are getting less socially able and yeah just yeah. you know and maybe like less close with people in general i don't really know if that's true but yeah well there was a there was a medical like study that said there's a correlation with the rise of social media especially mm-hmm. and teen suicide rates so like in the past you know, like 15 years mm-hmm. the teen suicide rates have like doubled and that's not just in the united states that's like mm-hmm. worldwide and that just in like develop, developed countries in developed yeah, countries right. yeah and like yeah. And, and the suicide rate is also twice as high in teen girls mm. than teen guys <clears throat> which probably has also so much to do with social media mm. and like that image right like because you're always thing. looking at other people's lives you're like you know, yeah I mean, which is like are, very sad yeah know? and people are like are literally only posting things that make themselves look good right like they're posting like oh look how great of a day I've had like look how like hot I am like look at yeah. all the stuff that I have and it's like damn that shit is like <laughs> it's depressing because then you look at it and you're like wow yeah. my life is filled with these shitty things because yeah but like I think I find at least for me personally if I like actually take a moment and just like think about <clears throat> all the good things about my yeah. life you very quickly are like unable to count like literally how many things are good in your life you know like yeah. I have a place to live right I have food right there's electricity I have clothes I have clothes yeah I have a phone and I like can communicate with people mm-hmm. and like I'm doing some cool work I don't have to like <clears throat> support my family yeah I'm not like scraping by or anything yeah. like that so I think we're pretty lucky and oh, we're super lucky we're just not aware of it all the time so but it's always that comparison right like what are you comparing yeah I, I had friends who I, I forgot who said this to me but you basically said like comparison is the thief, thief of joy Mm-hmm. Like you can't think, really be like super joyful if you're constantly comparing yeah. yourself to someone because someone's always gonna have like quote Some, unquote yeah. more better. better. Yeah, I agree. But I think there's comparison. So actually, I think I just saw this quote from this guy James Clear, but he sends out these like weekly newsletters of like mm-hmm. 
um, basically three quotes quotes by him, two quotes by others, and then like one like I can't remember what the last thing was, but it's supposed to be like <laughs> some kind of rounding thing, right? And one of the quotes was like, "Comparison is good when you're looking, or comparison sucks when you're looking at big things like money or uh, love or you know whatever, like things like that." But it's when you compare the little things that helps you grow like mm-hmm. looking at like other so, someone else's communication skills or looking at um you know how someone writes or how someone like uh you know looks at the world or whatever so when you compare it to that there's something to learn from whereas like when you're looking at the big things it's like you can't it's kind of overwhelming yeah yeah you can't learn from that you just think i'm never gonna get there yeah so there's a good and bad i guess yeah, it's very true. I yeah. don't know. Right. And yeah, also who you're comparing yourself to. That's true. I think it's like... Yeah, I, do, I don't really do social media that much anymore. Yeah, I that's tough like, a lot too. I also realized that like... I never really did Twitter anyways, but mm-hmm. like... Twitter's kind of just like a cesspool. Of yeah, life. oh totally. <laughs> it's just like... I mean, but there's also that science side of Twitter, which is actually kind of nice because then you can actually connect to like these other professors. Yeah, yeah. I know of like... But there's like people... other ways to do that, you know? yeah. Yeah, totally. It's just like... But it also makes it easy to like get a quick contact, I guess you could say. Yeah. Or see updates. Um, but there's so much with Twitter that's just awful. And Yeah, I don't use Twitter at all yeah. anymore. Yeah. Um, I mean, I never really did to begin with, mm-hmm. but even Instagram, I don't really use that much anymore. Um, yeah, I, I just try not to. Mm-hmm. It's just like, I don't know. Yeah, like, I for don't, me, like, I don't I, it. Facebook was huge for me back in the day, and then, like, I, I don't think I've posted anything on there, and, like, I don't even know how long. Like, it's crazy. I mean, I think I primarily use it just to organize events. Yeah, I mean, because yeah. it's super easy, because you can make pages. Yeah. But, yeah, I, feel. I don't know. It's definitely weird. I think... Yeah. Yeah, what's crazy is also like this incoming freshman class. I don't. I think they're the first class that weren't alive during nine eleven. Wow, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, the incoming freshman class of I like so. undergrads, right? Yeah, undergrads. Yeah, that's a good point. That's because what they're eighteen coming in, right? 9/11 so two thousand one. Yeah. So yeah, they were either just born. Oh, yeah, or weren't alive. Yeah, or weren't alive. That's so weird. Dude, we're old, man. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. No, we're not that old. We no, we're chilling. <laughs> yeah, we can still rock climb. We can still walk oh, upstairs. Yeah. yeah. So. No, whatever. We're like, what? You're 25? No, 24? I'm 24. Yeah. yeah, okay. I'm 24 too, so. Yeah, yeah. We're in our prime. We're good. Peak physical <laughs> fitness. <laughs> You're looking at peak physical fitness right here. <laughs> The epitome of just youth. <laughs> Me going to sleep at 11. <laughs> Seriously, though. Yeah. Well, yeah, we've talked a lot. We've covered a lot. Thanks yeah. for coming to the podcast, for taking yeah, the time. Thanks for having me. I'm going to advertise this to all the, all the fam and all the friends. Yeah, you got any plugs? Yeah. Where can people oh, find God. your work? Uh, I mean, we kind of talked, we don't use social media. Follow me on Twitter. And <laughs> on Twitter? Uh, no, actually, I did just post the picture that we took for the panel. Oh, Twitter. really? Okay. Um, at Austin underscore Lefebvre. Lefebvre. Um, um, if you want to know how to spell Lefebvre, it'll, just be, put it on. it'll be in the title of this podcast. <laughs> Perfect. So it's uh, not how you think it is. <laughs> no. <laughs> there are like three hidden letters in there. So <laughs> it's not English if you want to pronounce it. <laughs> um, and other than that, uh, yeah, no, that's it. I yeah. don't have anything else. Great. Thank. Yeah, thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me on here. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for tuning into this podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe. Talk with Toe is written and produced by Chris Toe. To learn more about Austin Lefebvre's work, you can find him online by searching for the Dignan Lab at UCI Biomedical Engineering. His most recent publications are titled A Non-Invasive Metabolic Investigation of Breast Cancer Invasion published in the Biophysical Journal, and the phaser flim analysis monitors metabolic changes at the leading edge in response to the RAC photo activation and mitochondrial transport in MDA MB231 cells, also published in the Biophysical Journal. Music is by Purple Planet. You can visit their website at purple-planet.com.